Yeah. That was the turning around mm. moment for my life. Hallelujah. All my struggles financially was over from there. We may look different and live in different countries, yet our stories are knitted with the same threads of excitement, uncertainties, challenges, and victories. As we journey through the ups and downs of life, it is our undeniable will and God's strength that propel us to joy after pain, smile after frowns, and ups after downs. We were born to win. We were destined to greatness. We are overcomers. Welcome to God Scoops, Raw and Unedited Stories. Welcome to Raw and Unedited Stories on God Scoop, where stories are told to uplift, encourage, and brighten your day. Today with us is a woman who has experience deliverance and from so many ch life's challenges and today she's here to tell her story welcome alice carlett to raw and unedited stories how are you my friend i am well thank you so much for having me i'm patricia I am so blessed and highly favored, and I'm so excited to share my journey with you today um, so that others can know that God is still a mighty deliverer. Amen. So, Allah, before you even start talking to our listeners about the nitty gritty of yeah. your journey, just tell them where you're from. Tell them a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm born Jamaican. I'm Jamaican by birth, but I'm a Jamaican national. I have lived um, in the British overseas territory Turks and Caicos Islands for the past 14 years I have spent quite some time in the Cayman Islands and you know I'm between Jamaica and the New York City so this ministry trim your lamps prayer ministry is an online based ministry I do not physically have a church it is a ministry that we're an online based community okay thank you and thank you for just joining us on God Scoop and Ala, talk to our listeners about the journey, your journey as a child and, a, and as a, just an adult and, 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 and how you got into knowing Jesus and, and starting all this ministry. Talk to us about your story. Well, um, this is going to be a very interesting story because, you know, I, I, I want to say to, to persons as, who are listening that, you know, as a child growing up, I remember um, at one period in my life, I was growing with my grandmother because, you know, my mother being a single parent at the time, she has three children. I'm the eldest, um, or even up to now, we, she has five kids, but I'm the eldest. So being the eldest, you know, there are so many pressure that is being placed upon you. But before that, um, growing up in a rural community in Westmoreland, Jamaica, the Western parish of Jamaica, you know, it was quite difficult to gain employment there. And my mother has me when she was 18 years old. So you can imagine a young adult having a baby. And then two years after that, she ended up with my brother. And so she struggled. She struggled to actually take care of herself and her children. Um, it was shortly after Hurricane Gilbert, about the year 19, 1989, my father had left. My father had left. So I remember having this vivid description of my father um, coming to the house and taking me, trying to take me to go be with his mother. That's my grandparents. I remember me having on this, you know, this church looking pretty sheen dress and my church shoes because back then that's how we used to dress you know when you're going out you're going to the clinic or hospital or wherever you're going whatever you wear to church you used to wear go out so I remember he holding me and I remember a bus stopped across the street from where we lived and my shoe fell off I was fighting him and my shoe fell off you know kids usually fight their parents and kick their feet so my shoe fell off in the road and and it, he says to the driver, driver, go, um, I'm going to take her back. And that was the last memory I have of my father. I oh. never see him from then. My brother and I, we grew up. And sometimes I get emotional talking about it because, 
you know, it's, it's not my fault that we were left on our mother. It's not her fault that, you know, two people have to create a child. And so the challenges that we, that, that I personally encounter my brother were as a result of one, we had no father in our, in our midst. We had no that support. We had, we had not that protector. And so, you know, I, we struggled. My mother had to then leave us to, with our grandparents at the time in Westmoreland. And she head to the second city called Montego Bay. When she went to Montego Bay, she went with a sister, live with a sister at the time, who invited her to come because she, you know, she was trying to gain employment so she could take care of her three kids at the time. And then they began to treat her bad. But that's another story. I know, I know. But, I know. Wait, wait a minute. Before you get there, mm -hmm. I really want to retrack a little bit to talk about your father. Was he trying to kidnap you? And how did that play out that you end up living with your mother? And I don't believe he was trying to kidnap me, but you know how it, how it goes in our culture is that you will spend some time in one parent and then they will take you and you will spend some time with another parent, our grandparents. It was that situation, but I think he knew that he was going to leave and he would not return because my mom told me that he did said to her that he was going to go away and not come back and he's sorry for her and the kids. So I think he, he wanted just to bring me into that environment so that I could stay with his parents, um, grand, his parents at the time, which is my grandparents who are still alive, you know, so I could stay with them. But I didn't want to do that as a young child. You know, children are usually comfortable in the environment in which they are you know my cousins were there and everybody were there but so as a kid i stuck to what i knew you know yeah so it was not perhaps of trying to kidnap me but based on our culture you know mother and father our custody trying to spend some time here and there that was the situation okay all right let's talk about your mother's experience in montego bay now so my mother went to montego bay to live with her sister at the time my eldest one of her elder sister at the time and you know, they invited her to come and when she went there, they began to treat her really bad. They began to treat her really bad and she ended up having to leave. And so, you know, she <clears throat> found a friend and it was that same sister who introduced her to a friend. A friend decided to put her up. So imagine coming from the western part of West, in Westmoreland of Jamaica, going into the second city, you know, hoping that you would find some shelter with your family mm -hmm. members, but they begin to treat her really bad. Do you, sorry, so, Ella, do you want to, do you mind just giving us the details on that? What do you mean when you say treat her bad? Treat her bad. I mean, I, I mean, you know, you know, what happened is that they told her that she could no longer stay there when they cooked, they were not giving her um, they were not sharing food for her. There was so much that were going on. You know, when I speak about it, you know, I really, really love my mother dearly. And the situation sometimes when I look that she has to endure, it really have an effect upon me. It, it really traumatizes me in such a way that sometimes, you know, and even with my father, many people would ask me why I don't speak about it because it has so much emotional impact on me. And I've learned to forgive and I've learned to, put things behind me, but there's sometimes, you know, rehashing and bringing up the stories, it, it, it just create this wound within me. And sometimes I just rather not talk about it. I pray about things and I just leave them in God's hands. And I apply the principle that I've preached always to forgive. Mm -hmm. And so I remember they told her she could no longer stay there. And they knew that, they knew that she had nowhere else to go. And so she ended up staying with this gentleman who told her that he could put her up mm -hmm. um she was in her church at the time um and so did the, the gentleman also was going to church but they were not in any based on what she told me they were not in any sexual relation it was just basically somebody needs shelter he has a place i'm gonna put you up so mm -hmm. the church got involved and the church realizes what was going on so they forced them to get married oh my goodness the church forces them to get married and so she got married and it, oh my goodness was not out of love so you know that went downhill and it was during that period of time i was about 12 years old and my grandmother at that time i was entering into 12 years old maybe 11 plus going to 12 years old and my grandmother that i was living with at the time she used to you know sell at a school gate at primary school gate you know stuff like food kind that the children could purchase so her her oldest daughter had filed for her to come to America as a as an immigrant. 
Mm -hmm. And so when she went to America, obviously now all the grandchildren that were living with her has to either find their parents or find a guardian, right? Because mm -hmm. she could not have left the children by themselves. So we now have to find our parents, our guardian. And so she, I had to come to my mother in Montego Bay. It was a one bedroom structure at the time, a mm -hmm. small structure at the time. Um, it was wide enough to hold two beds. But as you know, most of us as Jamaicans back in the day, we we grew up on these wooden structures. Sometimes, you know, you can see outside through the boards, right? Mm -hmm. But I remember, I remember it, it was just not an environment that I wanted to be in. Um, there was so much that was going on in the environment because it was not out of love. And, you know, looking back then, I, I, there are some aspect of it I'm grateful for mm -hmm. um, because it has helped to shape me for the person that I am really today. Yeah, Allah, so I remember Allah, you know, when I... Allah, one, one moment, please. I'm, I'm going to get back to what you're saying, but I cannot, I cannot um, allow you to move forward without talking about that aspect of our culture where people are forced to get married because it's, it's, it's seen as convenient or um, just if the two, a woman and a, and, and, and a man looks at each other and they start being friends and they say, okay, let them get married because they don't want them to fall into sin. And, and that is what I want to tap in now and talk about that relationship with your mother and this man who was forced to marry her. Talk about you know some of the, the the things that she went through really in details. Yes, uh, my mother's story is quite interesting, and she she she's a very um she she's very private in some aspect, and so you know sometimes I have to really pull details out of her. She will tell you the surface of what is going on, but but you know back then even up to today, you know when you're in the church in a good standing order and um. You know, if you're living with someone, you know, obviously the church has no idea what is going on. We, we have to assume that if you're living with somebody who, is, who you're not married to and you're in good standing in your church, then you have to make things right. And that's just the principle as to how the church operates. And so I believe, though, that, you know, it was out of the fact of desperation why she fell into that trap because she didn't want to go back to where she was coming from. She didn't want to go back to to nothing. And so she says, you know, I have to, I have to put out the extra effort. I have to suffer a little for my children. And so it is, it is out of that set based on what I'm, I'm understanding from her. It, it was out of that why she decided, you know what, it's either do or die. And so she did what they, obviously they did both did what they were they, that they did they got married but it was never out of love there were so many things that were going on and so i remember going to to this high this primary school and in flankers i went to flankers primary school and when i went there i was in grade six i was in grade six and you know i was the only one who passed at the time common entrance from that class but I remember while even going to that school, it was so difficult financially for my mother. I never had to take taxi. I was able to walk. But um, I remember it was so difficult that at times I, I didn't even have money to buy lunch. I go to school at many days without lunch money. But God has been faithful. And I met this this friend, childhood friend of mine at the school at the time. And because obviously... You know, I, because I was on a different level based on my intellect at the time, I, you know, there are people that wanted me to assist them. But I do, mm -hmm. I did make this childhood friends, even up to today, we're still friends. And her father at the time has a huge bus, is what we call a Tata bus. If you remember mm -hmm. what a Tata bus is like. Mm -hmm. And her father had a Tata bus at the time who used to supply the route of Montego Bay to Westmoreland. And she would come to school with so much money. Mm -hmm. And when she realizes that I didn't have money, I wouldn't be going to lunch and stuff. She would give me money. Sometimes she would say, you have lunch today? And I said, no. 
and she would come to school every day and she and you know i didn't understand it back then that god was just sheltering me and protecting me and providing for me mm -hmm. looking back i recognize that even though my mother didn't have money to give me i never had to miss a day of school i never had to go to school without lunch because this friend would provide it god would have blessed her and put it in her heart you know to to come to school and she would have buy and she bought me lunch daily and and you know we remain friends up to today and that aspect of my life was taken care of but it was a real real struggle for me as i was growing you know some situations that i personally fell into you know which i which i wish not to talk about here right now i mm -hmm. will share that story on another platform or another forum and um I remember now it was no time for us to go back to Westmoreland because my mother, that marriage had ended there. She ended up with two more kids with another person. And so it was time to go back to Westmoreland because now all the folks had left my grandmother's house. They were all migrated and my mother and another uncle of mine was the only one that were left in Jamaica with their kids. My uncle never had any kid at the, kids at the time, but my mother had five children up to this point. And so everybody was now migrated to New York or to America. And um, she was the only one left there. So she has to go back home to take care of the home and, you know, stuff like that. My grandmother at the time wanted us to go back to the house to take care of the house that she had built. So we went back to Westmoreland and I was living there. Up to this point, I was going to high school. It was a real struggle for me in high school. I remember living with my aunt, but before my mother moved back to Westmoreland, I, I had to personally go back to Westmoreland because where she was living, it wasn't appropriate for me as a young person. It, the space was just not there, you know, having three kids in that space. And so we had to go back. It was it was a joy for me to go back because I, you know, I'm growing into a young adult and you know, we needed our privacy and our space and stuff like that. But I remember, you know, God has always been a faithful God to me. And when I went back, I went back to live with my aunt at the time and she gladly invited me to come in. She had three children in our house and I was a four to one there. And, you know, she provided for me. She provided food for me. She provided a shelter for me. Um, it was though it was difficult for me to go to school because now I had to take two transportation or what we call taxis to get to school. And so it was quite difficult. But I remember her her common law husband at the time used to see my need and he would give me money at times to go to school. Mm -hmm. So much so that at the age of eight, 17, 18, I had a boyfriend. I met this gentleman that um, took care of me. Um, it was just what I needed at the time. Um, when he worked, he would give me money. I was still going to school, but that's just how I used to get by. And, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a great gentleman. God just provided that nurturing figure for me. And maybe that's why I stuck to him because I never had that growing up in my life, right? And so- Was he like he, a father figure? He was, yes, because he's quite older than me. He's about 10 years or so older than me. So he was very caring and nurturing and just wanted the best for me. And so, you know, he supported me. He helped me to get through my, and even at the time when I was supposed to do my CXC, I never had money to do it. And he assisted me, you know, it was so much challenging for me. But through it all, I, I, I just kept held, holding my head up. So... Fast forward now, when I got out, I did my sixes, I got my sixes, and now it was time for me to go to college. I had absolutely no money. There mm. was no money for me to go to college. I remember my uncle who was a teacher, he and his wife was a teacher at the time. He says to me, I can get you in Bethlehem Teachers College, but we need such and such a money. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I had not the first cent. My account, I had not even a bank account. I had not even a first cent. My mother didn't have the money. You know, it, it was really difficult for me. My family is not the kind that is, I love them dearly, but they're not the, the, the kind that supports others' dreams. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are some families that would rally around you as a young girl and ensure that you go. They're not that kind, you know, though everybody's different. But mm -hmm. I, it was a struggle for me, so I couldn't go. So my next bet was to go and look, work, seek employment because now... I graduated, what am I going to do? I have to seek employment. So I remember 
I remember going to different jobs. I remember even working at a lawyer firm and the money that I used to get was just enough for me to pay my taxi fare from home to work and buy lunch. And by the time I would call, get my pay on Friday, there was absolutely no money left for me to do anything. I could not even pay a bill. I could not even do anything. And I said, this does not make sense. I remember as a young adult in my early 20s, I remember just going even to Negril, taking buses, going to Negril, just walking at the resorts, dropping off my applications and still nothing. I remember getting a job at this resort in Negril and it was the same thing. They pay me so meager that it was just not worth it after I'm able to traverse that route. It was just not worth it. And so I decided that I had to stop. But here is how God is faithful. Mm. And throughout all of that, God has been faithful to me. And I struggled a little bit, but today I have my story to tell others that we can't give up on God. Mm -hmm. God never gives up on me. And despite... Hello, hello. One, one moment. I just can't listen to the story without wondering what became of your siblings during that time in those struggles. Well my my the last two siblings that i have their father was is in and their father was, was in their life um okay. you know so he supported them the best way he could um the third my mother's third child, child at the time was living with his father's side of the pair of his father's side grandparents um so it was just me and my brother my brother at one point had to go and live with with some church brother of my mm -hmm. mother because he had nowhere else so they had to put him up and um at the time when my mother went back to Westmoreland, all of us were at one point in the house. We all were there at that, that one point. Everybody came back home at that one point, except for my third brother, my mother's third child, who was in the vicinity, could comes and go until he, he finally came. So at one point, all of us were living there when things got a little bit settled when my mother moved back to Westmoreland. But up to the point, I'm still the eldest, you know? So... It, it, the pressure is really on me, very much younger than me. I remember those two siblings that I have, the two youngest, they were they were like five, six, seven, eight years old, you know, up to this point that I'm talking to you now. And so I remember, you know, one day I said, this gentleman, God is so wise that we cannot, we cannot father him. I remember this young man in the community said to me, I was saying to me, him, he used to work at his prominent resort in Negril. Um, everybody knows this resort. I'm just not going to call the name. But he said to me, um, you can, I said to him, are they looking anyone at your resort? He says, come with me, man. They're doing interviews Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I decided to go with him. So we jumped on the bus. Um, and we went. When I went to the interview, I never had a TRN, tax registration number. I never have my national insurance number. I had no clue that I had to have these things to get a job at that age. And so I went there and the gentleman, a security manager at the time said to me, where is your tax registration number? Where is your national insurance number? And I said, I don't, I don't know. I don't have it. He says, well, if you're going to do the interview, you have to have those things. And he says, tell you what, go to... Savannah Lamar, which is um, the Savannah Lamar in Westmoreland, the capital, mm -hmm. um, and apply. So he tells me where to go, and he says, go and apply for them. You will get it the same day. You will get a number, and then come back on Thursday. So I did that. I went back on the Thursday. I saw him, and I got through to go to inside to fill out the application form, and then they told me that there, if any vacancy comes up, they will call me. But God has set up that gentleman for a reason. Mm. He set him up to have favor on me for a reason. And when I, because he could have said, you know what? You don't have it, go home or whatever. But he directed me what to do, where mm. to go to get my tax registration number, my national insurance number. So when I went back um, and I was coming out, God just strategically placed him there. And he said to me, well, how did the interview go? I said, well, they said, that if there's any vacancy comes up, they will call me. And he says to me, tell you what, give me your number and I will check if there's anything comes up, I will call you. I gave him my number and I will call and I took his numbers. So occasionally I would call him and said, any vacancy comes up and he, cause I wanted to work at this resort. It was a prominent resort. This would have changed my life. 
And I would call him occasionally and he would say, no, nothing comes up. And you know what? I just got frustrated. I remember this one day, I just went on the road in Negril and I was walking, dropping off application. And I had no, the only money I had was to take my taxi fee. I had no water. I had no food. I was so thirsty. I was so hungry. When I got back home, my mother said to me, and this was a day that I broke. I broke this day. And every time I remember this day, I get emotional about it because I was, I broke down this day when I walked into the room, my eyes were just filled with tears. When I got off the taxi, my heart was just aching. I was just talking to God. I said, God, the situation that my mother is in at the time, you know, she needed help. I said, I'm the eldest child. I said, God, I know, you know, it's not my responsibility to take care of my parents, but this is what I want to do. And I remember my heart was so full that by the time I got out of the taxi to go inside the yard to get inside the house, and my mother said to me, how did it go? I couldn't even answer her. He, she said to me, how did it go? Did you get anything? I couldn't even answer her. I just went inside the room at the time that I was staying in my room at the time. I locked the door. I just fell down on my knees. Mm. And I began to cry. I said, mm. God, I cried and I prayed. I cried. I've never, I did not remember me praying this much in my entire life. I fell mm. down and I prayed and I cried and I prayed. And I said, God, you see the situation that we're in because up to the time we could not even afford certain things you know my grandmother who was in america at the time used to send a little bit of money but it was not enough to take care of the bills and everything so i remember breaking down i cried and i prayed i said god if you help me i will take care of my mother i said please help me you see the situation and you know it took me a while to re recover and it was about two years after that the answer to that prayer came. Mm. And when I tell people that God is an on-time God, God is really an on-time God. Mm. I kept going, but it seems like there were so much doors that were closing for me that I would not even get a job. Everywhere I go, it seems like I would not even get a job. That same gentleman that I met at that resort, mm. he had my number. I was coming from the time, I was coming from my boyfriend's house at the time. It was a Sunday, I cannot forget. And when I came to my mother's house at the time, I said, I was there and I had a ready cell phone at the time. One of these larger phones in Jamaica that came out in those times, in the 2000 or 2004, 2004, 2005 at the time. It was the ready celly. I had one of those phones at the time, but based on where our house is, you know, it's 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 it was so flat that sometimes it doesn't the signal of the phone does not pick up in certain area. So I had to really put it at my window, my bedroom window for it to anybody to call to get it. And I remember the phone, I was out on the patio or the veranda area. And I remember hearing the phone ring. And by the time I recognized the phone was ringing and got to the room, the phone stopped ringing. And I looked at the number and I said to my mother, somebody was calling me, but I don't know who. I don't know the number. I don't recognize the number. Mm. And I said, you think I should call it back? She said, yeah. I didn't have any money at the time. So she gave me money to go by the credit, the phone minutes or the minutes at the time. And I placed it, the prepaid minutes at the time. And I placed it on the phone and I called back the number. Lo and behold, it was the same gentleman that I met in the grill about two to three years ago. Wow. And he said to me, he was scrolling through his phone and he saw my name and my number. And he says, let me see if it's still working. And when he, re when he called it and it, it, I didn't pick up, he said, maybe I'm not using the number still. But it was God who says to me, call back the number. Mm. That, so when I call back the number and I begin to converse with him, he told me that at the time he was in Boscobel at the time and he had you know he was doing some work for the company and he said to me you didn't you don't get any job yet I said no and let me tell her that was it praise God yeah. that was the turning around mm. moment for my life hallelujah. all my struggles financially was over from there hallelujah when he called I called him back he said to me, I was in Boscobel, but he says to me, I'm now in Westmoreland. He said to me, there is the Negro Football Federation is having um, 
some event. He says, it was a Sunday evening. I cannot forget. He says, do you want to come? And I said, I will think about it and let you know. You know, wisdom, we have to use wisdom at times. I said, I will mm. think about it and let you know. Anyway, we finished Converse and I said to my mother, this gentleman that I met and I explained, my mother knew because I had told her about him. So I said, he's asking me if I want to come to the football federation. And my mother said, sometimes you have to go out and interact with people. And, she, and I said, you think I should go? And she said, well, you can go because you have to interact with people. So I got, I called him back and I said, yes, I will come to this, to this event because it was obviously a public event. So mm -hmm. I said, I will come to this event. I directed him where I live. The gentleman came and he picked me up. I remember me having this black dress on. I remember so clear. And my mother was watching and she took the license plate. No, I didn't even know she took the license plate number until sometime mm -hmm. after she was telling me. And I got into the car and as we were driving, he said to me, mm. they're interviewing tomorrow, which was the month, I think it was the Monday or the Tuesday, but he said to me, tell me something, would you work in this particular area? I said, sure, right now, anything will do. Mm. He said, they're interviewing for this to fill this position at the resort. He picked up the phone, he called mm. the HR manager and he said, such and such, sir, I have so-and-so here. And he gave him my name. I'm going to send her to the interview tomorrow. The gentleman says, send her. Mm. I got to the interview and I was interviewed with the manager at the time for that area. I interviewed with the general manager for that time. I interviewed with the HR manager. I went and I did the interview. And it was the first day they called me to tell me, pack your bag, we're sending you to Ocho Rios to train. Awesome. So I got to Ochi, I did the training, and that was it. Awesome. That job that I got, I was able to pay my bills. I was able to take care of my mother. I was able to take care of my siblings. I was able to do everything that I wanted to do. Allah. Yes. Allah. I am listening, and there's, there's, there's so much that is coming to me in your story where I see resilience. I see journey, I see purpose. I see where God doesn't necessarily work in a straight line. And I just want to ask you one question. What did you learn about God during and after you got your breakthrough, during your journey and after you got your breakthrough? What did you learn about God? You know, as I was going through my moments, I didn't, to, to be honest with you, it was, it was after I got my breakthrough that I'm beginning to recount my, my previous life and recognizing that God is a faithful God. Mm. God is an on-time God, that God is a purposeful God and yes. that God provides for his children. And, 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 and let me tell you something that, you know, when I look back at my entire life, I said, God, if I had gotten all those jobs, I wouldn't be available for this breakthrough that you were setting me up for. Mm. So the delay, the, the delay that I occurred, the, when God opened the door for me, I had no regrets. Mm -hmm. I had absolutely no regrets. And it was that, that opportunity that opened doors for me to move from Jamaica that migrates from Jamaica. It was that opportunity that has cemented me in the company that I am still in today after all these years. Hello. I think of Joseph. Yes. And I think of how they, they forgot, he, he was forgotten. And mm -hmm. I can't imagine when he was in the dungeon, he, he must have saying, God, have you forgotten me? And yes. it just took one day for his life to turn around. Praise God. From Praise the dungeon to the yes. palace. Mm -hmm. Praise God. But do you think the Lord, when he, he carries us through our journey of weight, that he's using that time to just strengthen us and prepare us for what is to come? Talk to us about that. Definitely. I, I think it was necessary for me to go through all those struggles because... Know that I am where I'm at. I can appreciate 
life more, appreciate God more. And when I see people going through similar struggles that I went through, I'm more empathetic. I am more compassionate towards them. It was necessary because it has taught me so much about God. Mm. It has taught me to wait on the Lord and be of good courage. It has taught me not to run ahead. It has taught me humility. And it yes. has taught me that what you see in front of you most times is not what God sees. It had taught me that the path that we want to go on is not the path that God wants for us. He Amen. wants so much more for us. We, we can only see in front of us. We can only see our eyes are limited, but God sees far and near. He sees Amen. wide and deep. And he was looking wide and deep into my life. I never knew that I would be here doing what I'm doing. I have no thought. I have no idea. But the good God that I serve is committed to give us good things. And this is why I'm comforted. Even in my life now, I'm comforted to know that. When things happen, I say, God, you will work it out. You have Amen. always been the one that worked things out for me. And you have been my help in ages past. And you will be continued to be my help for years to come. Amen. Allah. Yes. Thank you. What a story of faithfulness and resilience. You never gave up. Yeah. And I just want you to talk to those young people who are struggling now, not only in Jamaica, but all over the world to realize their, their, their purpose and, and, and just to trust God, even when the things seem as if uh, um, everything is, 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 is at, the, at the bottom. Talk to them, just take a minute to just talk to them. You know, it, it is very hard at times when you're going through struggles to see anything else but your struggles. You know, sometimes we try to comfort ourselves with words and affirmation. And even after those words would have faded away, all we see is our, are our struggles. But here's the thing that I have to say to other young folks or other individuals. I have learned along the journey that if God is holding my hand, I can't, I can't fail. If God is holding my hand, I can't take a wrong turn. So all the path that my life is going on, if God is holding my hand, there are paths that are necessary for me. I don't, I may not understand why my feet has to be bruised now. I may not understand why I have to butt my toe, but along the journey, when you have become victorious and overcomer, you will understand why those things. Remember, all our characters has to be developed and be God will bring us to a sense of flourishing where he work on us as individuals. Amen. He's interested in us as an individual. He's interested in refining our characters. So the stages we have to go through in life, the struggles, if we don't go through the struggles, how will we have testimonies? Amen. How will we share in others? How will we be empathetic towards others? How will we become co-laborers with Christ if we have not faced the struggles others are facing? So, so these are all necessary. And along the way, I know that God is real. I look at Job's story. I look at even Joseph's story. I look at so many stories in the Bible. I look at the stories of the three Hebrew boys. I look at Daniel's story and I'm remembering. I look at Samuel's story. I'm remembering and I'm comforted from these stories that God God has always been faithful. Amen. And even Amen. in David's story, he yes. slipped. And for those who have slipped and fell and have committed atrocities, we need to know that there is still hope. God does not cut us off. As long as we can find it in our heart to get on our bending knees and repent, oh, praise God. Heaven's door is wide open Hallelujah. to receive us and to put us back together. You know, there's a beautiful song that I love that says the potter wants to put us back together again. Hallelujah. You know, if you're broken, God wants to do so much for you. And today he is still available for Amen. every young person who is struggling. I want to say to you, keep on praying. Prayer still works. Amen. And Allah, I'm glad you're onto that because I was just going to ask you to just pray for our listeners and pray for the God Scoop community and 
and know that through your journey, it has taught you how to pray and trust God. And I don't even have to ask you about that. I know it. I, I, I've listened to you. And, and I see where God has uh, really carved you into to that woman of prayer. So take this minute to pray for us. Okay, let us pray. Great God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we are comforted to know that you are the sovereign Lord of our lives. And in this moment, Lord, I ask you to touch every situation that your children are going through. There are many who will listen, God, who may feel broken, hurt, abused, may be feeling distraught. There are many, God, that are in depression, many that are in denial, many are anxious for their own lives, they are in fear for their own children. But whatever their situations are, whatever traumatizes your people, whatever causes your people to be unsettled, I ask of you, Lord, with your righteous right hand, that you will move upon those situations and redirect their lives in the way that you intend best for us. I pray, God, today that somebody will know that Jesus provides so much hope. So we are never alone. You promises us that you will walk with us. You promises us that even in life's most difficult moment you will be with us and I know that you are our omniscient God our omnipresent God who still works miracles you have supernatural power to change a situation right now so God whatever they're facing with whether be it with a relationship issues with their spouse with their children be it financial situation be it situation that is causing in their health to deteriorate whatever it is god you are god and god alone work in your own time work by your own might and work for the good of your people in jesus name i pray amen amen amen, amen. thank you alice carlet yes. for sharing your story for sharing jesus with us amen and thank you for your prayer. Thank you so much for having me. There's so much more left. Maybe we have to do a part two and a part three because God is really real. I have not even touched the surface of when I began to transit into ministry. It's, it's, just, it's just so unreal. God is an amazing God. Thank you so much, Patricia, for having me. Thank you to your co-host, Gary. Thank you to all of you and to my God School family. Just hold on to God. He is faithful. And he that is faithful has called us to be faithful. Let us together hold the hand of Jesus and he will take us along life's journey. Amen. Bless you, sister. Bless you. Thanks for having me again. Our listeners, thank you to our listeners who tuned in today on Raw and Unedited Stories. Yes. And if you need to contact Allah for any reason at all, for prayer or just talk to her, you can see her information in the description box below yes. and remember to share and like and remember subscribe so that folks can hear stories like these and more have a phenomenal day